Well, good morning, St. John family. How are you? Happy Sunday. What a beautiful day for us to gather as God's people. This side of an empty tomb, the resurrection is still true. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. And, you know, we, we are reflecting on that resurrection joy in these days of series. We've entitled Complete Joy. And really, it's not our title. It's coming right from God's Word. We're going to dwell on that a little more as we get into a greater part of chapter 2 of John's epistle that he wrote uh, in follow-up as an eyewitness to the resurrection and how that changes still today everything and every aspect of our lives, a resurrection perspective. And may God grant that to all of us as we gather in his presence today. I do want to share a couple other things going on as well. Um, one of them is uh, coming up next weekend we got a special deal going on on Sunday uh, afternoon. Our brand new pastor, Pastor Tyler Cronkite, uh, is finally going to be starting and, and uh, we'll be installing him next Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m. This is a special celebration installation service. Um, if you've never been to one before, come experience it. It's a really special thing and music will be great. The time in the Word will be great, time in community and especially for us to open our arms to uh, Pastor Tyler and Brandy as uh, he begins his ministry here. He will also be preaching through the weekend next weekend. So here's what I, reason I tell you that is because he's preaching his first official kind of message among us before he's installed, it'd be really nice to him next weekend because we don't want him to change his mind from when he preaches to when he's installed. Are you with me on this? All right, thank you. I'm kidding. Um, excited about this, big way. Um, I want to share too, Maybe you've been saying, hey, I want to serve. I just don't know where, when, uh, where are opportunities. we got two opportunities coming up very soon. 27th of April, we are having a, a, a St. John Campus Spring uh, Spruce Up Day. That's a Saturday morning on April 27th, 9 to 2 p.m. I would dare say if you can't be here for that whole time, it's okay. Come when you can. But a great chance for us to share some family community here. It would be a great serve event for all ages. We'll just be doing a lot of yard work and fix up things around the campus going on that day. Food will be included at, at lunchtime. Um, another one coming up a little bit later is on May 4th. Mark that down as uh, we go to make a difference with one of our primary mission partners, St. Paul in Pontiac, doing a mission partner makeover that day. And so more uh, yard work and things like that. If you love getting involved and getting your hands dirty for Jesus, it's a great time for you. So Get that uh, note on that is in the connection. You can read more about it. Um, also, too, just to add this to the mix, there's an announcement. Read about this, but it's a ways out. But coming up June 1st and 2nd, we're doing a worship shift this summer as we get into the All to Jesus renovations that are going to be going on on this side of the campus uh, in our existing facility, making this room inaccessible. Um, note what's going to happen. We're moving worship over to the sanctuary starting June 1st and 2nd, temporarily for the summer. Um, and we're also shifting the time to accommodate that to 11. So make careful, careful note of that. You can plan for it now, but just want to get it on the radar. We'll talk more about it as we get closer. Folks, good to be with you. It's a great day. Let's stand in God's presence in the joy he comes to bring. If you guys are wondering, Andy and I are going to lead the Modern Praise Service with the organ, just to clarify that. Uh, gather in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is my hope for all of us this morning as we come into this time that we are reminded of a God who provides, yes? A God that uh, gives us a hope and an answer in the world that it seems like offers many that lead us to nothing. But we get to come before our God here this morning and be reminded of his goodness, of his power, the freedom that we have in Jesus, and the new life that is provided in that name. So as we join together, let's just enter into this time with a brief moment of prayer uh, so the Lord just firms up that foundation of belief. Heavenly Father, we ask that you are going before us this morning, that the songs that we, we sing together here glorify you, but that, Lord, we can be blessed by them being reminded of your provision, of your power, in the mighty name of Jesus that is with us in every moment, every situation, may you be glorified, Lord, and may our hearts be filled with your joy. We give you thanks, Lord, in your name.
give you praise that we can come and declare that truth. Lord, that we put our hope and our trust that there, there is no battle left to us, that it's all been handled by you. We give you praise for that. sin that we face, Lord. Lord, and some of us come in here in this time, and 
We go, well, we just keep doing the same thing, and we already have known, Lord, that it is disobedient, that it's sinful. But the good news of Jesus is that it is finished, it's done, that we can rely on his name and the power of the blood, that we are called his children, children who he loves, who he's for, who has good things in store. We give you praise for that this morning. So as your people, we say in agreement together. Amen. You guys may be seated. I want to read these words to you from, from 1 John chapter 2. John writes, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I'm writing to you, children, because you know the Father. And I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you, you've been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have, have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. It's First John chapter 2. And in today's gospel, I want to read this as well as we continue this Easter joy and that resurrection uh, witness. Luke chapter 24, it says this. And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and he said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you so troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. That is, it is my, my, I myself touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations from beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. 
And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Luke 24. So the resurrection continues among us, right? And this is John's words that we read just before Luke's gospel. In John's account, we read Easter Sunday as well. And the, the fact is that this resurrection reality changes how we process and, and, and focus our lives. It, it's what God has done that isn't just about a day in the calendar that we come together and get all dressed up and that's that. No, it's about something that changes people. And God's been doing this all along. And you got John as a witness to the resurrection. Um, think about this too. John's witness also to the crucifixion of Jesus. John was present there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is arrested, taken away. John is there fleeing with the rest of the disciples. You've got John there then at the cross. Some of the words of Jesus from the cross when he says to his mom, he says, behold your son. He's referring to John there and he says, behold your mother. This moment of compassion from the cross. John's there. John is also there on resurrection day when the tomb is found empty and John puts that great detail in his gospel that he outruns Peter right to the tomb as a rub-in moment for all eternity, right? I love that. He's just a faster runner and he just had to add that. That's awesome. <laughs> John was there. And in the days that would follow and what this new reality would bring about, John bears witness to that. And the day comes where he writes not only his gospel, the gospel of John, but also these epistles to fellow believers. You notice how he said that. I write to you, not because you don't know the truth, but because you do know the truth. And and how easily we can be deceived. He's writing to them, and I love those words, you know, like as a, as a father, writing to them and encouraging fathers and, and, and children and, and youth, and parents, encouraging them in this day. Now, last week, Pastor Steve gave us a little introduction, and I want to put a verse that was very important to the beginning of, of chapter 1 of, of 1 John. Can we put that verse up here? Read, read it with me. We write this what? To make your joy complete. This is kind of the beginning. This is verse 4. John is saying, I'm writing to you all, and there's a purpose for it. It's to make your joy complete, to bring you joy. Um, what are things that bring you joy today? My guess would be, maybe you could list, maybe it's your family sometimes, right? That was meant to be funnier. Um, I would guess some of you would maybe name a hobby. Maybe it's golf. Maybe it's the Red Wings winning in overtime last night. That probably brought you joy in that moment if you're a hockey fan. Uh, maybe watching, going home today on a beautiful day and just sitting back and watching the Masters. That maybe brings you joy. Maybe joy for you is spending time outside later today. Maybe joy for you, what brings you joy is your work. You love your work. You love your job. Maybe that's what brings you joy. I mean, I love that question. What brings you joy? Um, I, I'll tell you this. So we're going to learn more, as Pastor Steve talked about, um, that he's writing this to bring us joy and that great joy of realizing I'm loved and forgiven even when I'm deceiving myself and when I admit my sin, God is faithful and just, as John writes in that first chapter. You know, God's love brings joy. Also, the expression of sharing that love when I come to know that love of Jesus brings joy. And we're going to learn more about that through this series, including next weekend when our new pastor, Pastor Tyler, is going to come and preach and share um, as we get into chapter three how important that love being expressed toward others is. And, and speaking of great joy in our new pastor, I think it's important that you get an inside look of where great joy is found with our new pastor. Can I, can I share it with you? Here it is. It is true, he is a Minnesota Vikings fan, but what makes the great joy for me, he is the only person in my entire life that I've ever met and shared the joy of being a Minnesota Vikings fan that has taken me up on becoming one himself. He's a convert. Um, there wasn't much joy for him this past year, but I love that. Anyway, enough, I, you're like, I can't unsee that now, thanks so much. That's all I'm going to be thinking about the rest of your talk. Oh, well. Um, had to share that. But here's, a, I'm getting back to this. So John is writing, and he's writing about the joy that comes in break, and, and he's writing, you know, as, as a father figure to those believers in that early day. And, and, and then he gets to these verses, and as you think about in your life today, 
what are things not only that bring you joy, but reverse that. I bet it's an easier list if you think about what robs you of joy. Am I right? I bet you could come up with 10 things that rob you of joy, that are joy suckers in your life, that just suck away the joy and lead you without joy. And, and John is going to add to that list today, and what's deceiving about this, and, and, and maybe a light enlightening to us, is that what he's going to bring out is something that I think often shows up on our what brings joy to us list. And he's saying, don't be deceived. A lot of things that bring us joy aren't what they seem. That's what he writes. Do not love the world, he says, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I want to pause for a moment. You know, when we're born into this world, what we are taught culturally is that what the purpose of life here is, is to find love in this life, in this world, right? Love things of this world, to really immerse ourselves in contentment and happiness and joy. That, that's the goal of life, isn't it? I mean, at every turn, that's what we want, isn't it? We want joy in family, we want joy in relationship, we want joy, we want to pursue something uh, that brings love and brings completeness and and all of it promises great things. And we might even add, I love this world. Oh, be careful not saying that too loud. Because as John is saying here, if we love the world too much, we are at a disconnect in our relationship with God. And the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, he says, and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the reality is the world is passing away along with its desires. I want to just stop there for a minute. You know, the desires of the flesh, um, what's he talking about there? And, and usually if we let Scripture interpret Scripture, the door opens pretty widely to sexual immorality and things of the flesh and lust of the eyes and thoughts of that, things that... that drag us away from God. And, and the thing is, is a lot of times they can seem really good. They can even seem very pure. And say, I feel this is what I'm supposed to do. This is who I, what I'm supposed to uh, go after. Or this is if this person is exactly what I want or, or this thing or this, um, this habit. And, and we might even feel a, 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 just a moment of joy in the midst of it. And, and it's amazing the effect of dopamine has on being deceptive in, in what is real, in what is true. And yet it can be so real, entrenched in it. Now, he, he doesn't just say desires of the flesh. And then he says the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. And the question is, what, what's he talking about there? And I wanted to dive into that a little deeper. I, I discovered, you know, a lot of scholars, based on context and based on the language he's using in the Greek, it seems pretty clear what he's talking about here is materialism. And, and that what's going on is love of the world, not only the lust of the flesh sexually and beyond, it, it also can be a love of materialism. And, and, and this is what one scholar wrote. He says, various interpretations along these lines refer to the boasting of one's wealth, showing off one's possessions, boasting, boasting of one's social status or lifestyle. Um, he goes on, he says, in this case, the, the material security of one's life and possessions produces a boastful overconfidence. This understanding better fits the context here. The, the focus is on people who may operate purely on a human level and have no spiritual dimension to their existence, as far as they know. This is the person who loves the world, whose affections are all centered on the world, who has no love for God or spiritual things. The love of God, the Father, is not in him, as, as John would write in verse 15. The arrogance produced by material possessions is what is intended here. The person who thinks he has enough wealth and property to protect himself and ensure his security has no need for God or anything outside himself. And I know it's happening in the room right now. I'm reading this. You're like, oh, I'm so glad I don't struggle with that, right? <laughs> and isn't that amazing? We live in the wealthiest nation that has ever existed in the world. We are the wealthiest people that have ever existed in this world. And how quickly we can dismiss that, say, well, that's not talking about me. Or is it possible we've been deceived? 
Is it possible that our culture has so infatuated us with materialism that it actually does drive us and actually is the center of pretty much everything we do and think about? We're surrounded by it. The reminders are everywhere. Every advertisement reminding you of what you don't have, what you could have, which would give you joy if you just have that car or that gadget or that thing or that outfit or go to that place. John is saying that the world's ways are very deceptive. So we shouldn't expect that, okay, when we look at something that is appealing, it must be of God. No, we should assume if something's appealing, maybe it isn't of God. Just because it feels right, looks right, and, and we think it's right, doesn't mean it's right. Because as we've learned, if we've gauged our hearts at all in this, our hearts are not a good gauge for figuring out what's right and wrong because we're messed up people. As we turn to God, he reminds us, don't love the world. And love with the world is actually to be out of love with God. How deceptive is this? Remember years ago when I was um, studying to be a pastor, I was home at my home congregation. My pastor, Pastor Metzger, was doing a message, and I remember him sharing this story. He said there, there was this, this man, he was overwhelmed by, by his wealth, and he went to see a a spiritual advisor, a counselor on it. He, he was just scared and anxiety prone and just worried about losing it or how the market was performing and fear just gripped him constantly. And he went to see this, this counselor and was pouring out his heart, you know, just how, how much fear he had or that this family was going to take everything that he had or, you know, just what, what was he going to do? And finally the counselor says, I need you to stand up. And he's like, okay. And he said, go over to the window and look out the window. Tell me what you see. And he did. He went over there. He thought, this is really silly. And he's looking out. He's like, well, it's a sunny day. I see a park. I, I see children playing. I see a, a young mom walking a stroller with a baby. I, I, I see a bunch of young boys. They're playing a game over there. And, and the counselor says, good. Okay. So you see that. And he says, now I want you to go over there. See that mirror on my wall. I want you to go look into that mirror and tell me what you see. He's like, really? He's like, yeah, just do it. Just do it. Humor me, do it. And he looked in the mirror and he says, well, I, I see myself. And that's when his spiritual counselor, he says, well, then hear me when I say it. Isn't it interesting that both of those involve looking through a pane of glass and yet one of them is coated with expensive silver on the backside and all you can see is yourself. He says, hear me on this. All you see is yourself right now. Maybe that's where you've been for a long, long time now. You're so consumed and so driven and, and you're on one more promotion or one more area of success or one more purchase away from being filled with joy. And the reality is what God is telling us is may it not be because it's not true and it's not real. So what's it look like? Is, is God saying you know, things of this world and all materialism and, and wealth is, is evil? Of course he's not saying that. But when we start to shift that as resurrection people filled with the joy of Jesus, how do we look at it differently? It's truly the blessing that it is from God and that God has and, 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 and given us this gift of life and blessed us with what we have. What does it look like to honor that? My dad, um, my father, um, not, only the, not only is the most spiritual guy, but I do remember as a kid those moments where he taught me the spiritual truths that I will never forget. And one of them was one day we were uh, late to church. The family were in the car. And my mom says to my dad, hey, did you grab that offering envelope? And my dad says, you know, I wrote the check, but I, I, I forgot to grab it. And hey, Mark, will you run in the house? Go get the offering. It's on the desk. And I, I run in, and there's this checkbook all written out. And I look at the amount and all the zeros that are behind this gift, and, and I just like, <gasps> I did kind of one of those, like, wow, and I tore it off, I put it in the envelope, and I, I'm holding it, I'm thinking, I had no idea, and I came out to the car, handed it to my mom, and after we got to church, uh, everybody was going inside, and my dad held back with me, and he, we're walking along, and he said, did, did you see the amount, and I said, I, I, I did, dad, that, that's a lot, and he said, I was hoping you'd see it, and he said, for this reason, I want you to remember something. You can never outgive God. 
It says, I've learned in my life, God has blessed us beyond measure, and I've learned I can never, ever outgive God when I honor him first in our life, in our family. I'll never forget that, right? That's resurrection reality, living, not in, in, in living in scarcity, but living in an abundance mindset that says, I'm going to honor God with first with what he's given me, and then I'm going to live off of what's left because I'm going to honor God in that way as a generous person who says the resurrection changes me. Remember this too, Shane and I were invited uh, in our first, when I was first called as a pastor, a couple invited us to their house, and I learned this again. Um, they were nearing retirement, and they were all excited. They invited their family and us to come and share this meal. And they were sitting around the table, and there's this moment where um, the dad, he, he has a toast, and he says, I, I'm here, I want to tell you why we've gathered here. And, and this couple, I mean, they just exuded the love of Jesus, just so humble, so loving, and, and I just loved them and loved their witness and, and their passion for the gospel. And here he is giving this toast, and I'm, I'm thinking, what's he going to say? And he says, the reason we've gathered here tonight is because we've just paid off our mortgage. And, and, and we, when we were married and we bought our first house, we prayerfully said, Lord, someday when we pay off the house, on top of our ongoing tithing, giving 10%, they've been doing that their whole marriage, when that happens, we're going to add the cost of our mortgage every month. We're going to add that on top of our ongoing giving to give in abundance beyond anything we've ever been able to do. We gathered you here tonight to say we're going to be able to finally do that, and we couldn't be more excited and filled with joy. And we wanted to share it with you as our family and as our pastor. There was nothing that was bragging about that. It was all about absolute humble joy. And I remember holding Shane's hand under the table saying, oh, wow. We are on holy ground here. What does it look like to pe people not living like this, but living like this in a world that is all about this? Resurrection changes things. It's an open tomb, right? And an open hand to love. And he ends that verse we just read with these words, right? Right? The world is passing away along with its desires. I mean, when's the last time you ever went to a funeral where there was a U-Haul being pulled behind the hearse, right? Don't take it with you. It's temporary. So what do we do with it? Not just for ourselves, but rather what do we do for it to honor God in this world? And whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, is he saying here that the one who does this and honors God, now you're going to earn for yourself heaven. Is that what he's saying? No. Context is important, right? When we are abiding in Christ, his abiding in us, what he's done for us, dying a death in our place and the resurrection that changes our reality, that death no longer has sway over us, that we are people forgiven and set free to live for him today. Abiding now is, has a whole different context. I love how this goes on. Read these words with me from 1 John 2, 24. Let what you heard from the beginning, he says. This is what abiding is all about. Abide, abide in you. Let those words, what you heard, abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us. What's that promise? Eternal life, right? It's a gift made possible by Jesus. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Uh, he talked about the Antichrist, those who are against the gospel, those who are saying Jesus isn't God, those who are uh, undermining the faith. He says, I'm writing to you about those who would bring about deception in this world. But, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. Just as it has taught you, abide in him, and now little children abide in him. I mean, how many times can you use the word abide, right? Repetition must mean something here, right? It's important. A God who abides in us. Oh, by the way, that anointing, when did, when did you receive God's abiding presence in your anointing? What's your anointing? Baptism, the Holy Spirit that comes on you. If you're an adult believer that came to faith later in life and, and the, the word of God had its effect on you and the spirit impacted your heart, you received that anointing and your baptism only affirmed and confirmed that further. If you were a child and you were baptized and the Holy Spirit worked through that means of grace in that moment to bring the anointing of God's presence. This is a, about a saving faith that God has given over his people, abiding in him and to have this 
awareness that opens eyes in a fallen, broken, temporary world of what it means to live in light of eternity with the abiding presence of Jesus that enables, enables us to live differently in this world. I, I was thinking about this final thought here, and I'll, I'll conclude is, uh, my dad taught me another moment. I remember this well. He had, uh, he got me all geared up. Um, when I was 12 years old, we went on our first hunting adventure um, out of the area, and we drove all the way up to northern Minnesota, Thief River Falls, way out in the middle of nowhere, to go goose hunting. And we arrived that night, right, before the sun set, and we went out over to look over the field where we'd be hunting the next day, and uh, the goose blinds that were set up with hay bales out in the middle of this field, and they were surrounded by hundreds, and I dare say maybe even thousands of geese were out on this cornfield that had been harvested. Geese were even standing on top of the blind. They were everywhere. It's hilarious. And I'm thinking, this is going to be the easiest thing ever. It's almost not fair to be a goose, right? And I'm thinking, I can't wait for tomorrow morning when we go hunting. And so could hardly sleep that night, get up really early before the sun's up. We go down and, and we drive in. We way back away from the field. We walk in, hike in with the guide. And there's, of course, it's dark and the, the geese aren't there. So we get in the blind, and the guide put all the decoys, the fake geese out there. We'd been practicing our goose calls, like, for weeks and months. Dad was teaching me how to call a goose. I'm like, we are so ready. They do not have a chance, right? And sun comes up. Here we go. You know, I'm honking, and, honking and, and, and we're waiting and waiting, and I can hear the geese in the distance. There's thousands of them. You can hear them. I'm like, they're coming any minute. Half hour turns into two hours, three hours, five hours. It was time to go get something to eat. We go uh, next day, still no geese. Third day, no geese. Geese never came over the blinds. They never came back to the field. And I remember on the way home thinking, I'd never fired one shot. And looking at my dad, and my dad says, oh, if we could be as smart as geese. And, and the older I got, I realized what a spiritual lesson that is. Oh, if we could be as smart as geese, to not be deceived. There's so many things out there that look real. They sound real. They feel real. They're not real. You know all those geese? They were across a river several hundred yards away in a place called a wildlife refuge. And they were safe. There was no touching them. And they knew it. God says, abide in me. Abide in my word. Abide in times of worship. Abide in realizing my abiding presence is in a, in a special meal where you're going to receive a strengthening of your faith that draws you closer to your Savior and reminds you that he is real, he is true. Abiding in that place, not neglecting the gifts of our God and living in the joy that he comes to bring. These are great days inside of an empty tomb, aren't they? And the joy that is his and is ours. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for open eyes in a culture that is so deceptive. An evil one that would do everything he could to thwart our relationship with you. And yet, Jesus, you break through it through your death, through an empty tomb, through an abiding presence of your word and in a God who opens eyes and hearts to see beyond what's right in front of us, beyond what's even temporary, but to realize you've made us for eternity. And that means today matters too. How we walk this world and, and navigate it in light of eternity, but also navigating it in light of those whom we've been called to become in the light of the gospel. People who cannot help but speak about what we have seen and what we have heard. People who cannot help but share, cannot help but love, cannot help but abide in the love of a Savior Jesus and, 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 and be immersed in your word, in your presence, in the gift of the sacrament, in time in worship, in time in community. Lord Jesus, have your way in these resurrection days on this side of a tomb that changes everything and brings joy. Thank you for that joy. In Jesus' name today. Got joy in the struggle, got peace in the storm, got strength in the battle, I don't fear anymore. I'm a child of heaven, my hope is secure. 
joy. I've got joy because I got Jesus. today that we are forgiven that there is no sin that can separate us that we can find our trust in you and not in what this world offers us but yet we're human right lord you see us in how fragile we are and we give you praise lord that you sent us your son and it's in him lord he's done all the heavy lifting that we can come to you new every day Lord, that we can, we can lean into that. Lord, as new creations in Jesus, where our joy is truly made complete, may we abide in those truths. Lord, we give you praise, and we thank you that we have the opportunity to bring our request to you. Let's take a moment to just center on the goodness of our God. Jesus, you want us in our lives to be filled with that complete joy that you came to give us. Sometimes that joy is just in amazement for what you've done for us. Sometimes it's joy because we're unsure, just as the disciples were, of what's going on in our lives. And yet we know all things are in your hands, and that we can lean into you and trust you. And sometimes that joy is in the middle of tears that we are shedding, because we can look beyond this moment in you and know that our eternity is in your hands. So, Lord, with all that in mind, we bring you the prayers of your people today in this place. And 
any of those situations go on for them. And so we pray for them. Some are sick, some are suffering, some are waiting for results. Some are on the edge, trying to make it through every moment. You know all this. You know the secrets of our hearts already. But as the body of believers, we lift this before you because you promised to hear us. And so we pray for Ashley, and we pray for Dave. We pray for Mary. We pray for Laura. We pray for Rick. We pray for Arnold. And we pray for another Ashley. Lord, we know your arms are around them. We know you will sustain them. We know you will strengthen them. And we wait on you. Lord, there are those in the midst of tears. Sorrow has gripped their hearts because their loved ones are now separated from them. But Lord, they are not separated for eternity. There is a reunion that is coming because you live, we live also. A reunion where we will join them once again. So in the time that remains here, grant your comfort and your strength your peace on these families that we name before you that they may know again you are the resurrection and the life for the family of Brian Costigan for the family of John Mallon and for the family of Roy Jewell Lord grant strength grant guidance in the things that we do throughout our lives but especially as your people in this place as we seek new leadership, that your hand of blessing is on nominations and people who will volunteer to serve and to lead us in so many different ways, for your blessing to be on the upcoming eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C., for safety, for just enjoyment, to surround them with knowledge, and just a time that they can remember the rest of their lives. We ask, Lord, as we go out and serve in our community, that you bless that, that there might be moments just in our serving where we can give testimony to your goodness and your life in our spring spruce up, in our mission and partner, Mako. And Lord, we are, we are those who stop and come back and give you thanks for all the blessings we have in our lives. We thank you, Lord for a baptism that just occurred of Roman Joseph Williams, making him a child and an heir to your kingdom, your forgiveness, and your gift of eternal life. We thank you for Bob and Ann Danielson celebrating 40 years of marriage together and that blessing you brought together and for Brian Beckett's 40th birthday. Lord, all these things we rejoice at but we rejoice especially to be in your presence. We rejoice especially at your forgiveness that you shower on us. Because Lord, we know our honesty in our hearts is that we have failed and that we are sinners and that we are broken and we need a savior and that's who you are. You came that we might have life abundantly in you, forgiveness and hope once again and you come to us in this gift of your body and blood today to strengthen us with that forgiveness that our eyes of faith might see you once again and know your love surrounding us. So all that we pray today and all that we ask, Lord, we now pray in the words you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, take, eat, this is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in 
remembrance of me. Our Lord prepares for us this banquet, this feast in which we come to take his true body and blood, to rejoice at his presence with us, his gift of forgiveness with thanksgiving. And so we come. Amen.
of grace is Jesus my Redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep boundless peace to this I hope my hope is only Jesus for my life is only bound to His oh how strange and divine I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Night is dark, but I am not forsaken. From by my side, the Savior.
eyes long to see that day when the race is complete, when we stand before your throne and we say, not I, but through you. That's why I am here, because you promised us. And we hold to that promise, the promise of everlasting life in your presence. Lord, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Lord, we rejoice. We rejoice at this gift. We rejoice in your presence. We rejoice in your love. We rejoice that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. So Lord, in our rejoicing, hear our prayers. Let the joy of our heart rise before you like an incense that's pleasing aroma, that you see us as your people as we are, but you see us through Christ in us. We give you all glory and praise forever and ever in your name. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance on you, his smiling face, his favor on you, and give you his peace now and always. Amen. There's nothing